Public enemy number one. The one guy, or team, NBA fans, and even some people in the media see as the number one target for backlash, criticism, and, well, the NBA's version of the most wanted. Or, as many of us like to call it, a villain. I don't know when this exactly became a notorious subject in the NBA, but I might have an idea. Back in 2010, LeBron James told the world that he'd be signing with the Miami Heat to play the next chapter of his career on the one hour long ESPN premiere titled The Decision. LeBron, what's your decision? And while looking back now, some of us remember it as one of the most memorable moments in NBA history and something that forever revolutionized the NBA. So many people were offended by not just LeBron going to Miami, but offended by the way he announced his decision and what he did famously in the Miami Heat's 2010 team intro when he predicted like 25 championships. Okay. That might have been the worst it's gotten. But the fact is that this has actually been a theme in the NBA for a really long time now. About 99.9% .9 of you weren't really around to follow the NBA's quote-unquote villain in the 1950s or 60s, or even the 70s. I mean, are we seriously gonna sit back and try to make a case for some plumber in the 1950s as the NBA villain and most hated? Hmm, okay. So maybe villains came of age in the NBA once social media became a thing. Actually, no. The 1980s is when a lot more of today's NBA fans actually began following the NBA. And not surprisingly, that's the time the NBA really began molding into the NBA we know and love today. Well, kind of. You see, the Celtics-Lakers rivalry was great for the NBA. We had a white superstar from Indiana in Larry Bird playing for the Boston Celtics, and we had a black superstar playing for the Los Angeles Lakers, both incredibly charismatic, and two guys that helped the NBA reach an audience outside of the United States, which is crucial in really dissecting how NBA villains became a thing. Larry Bird shot threes and made a bunch of them, won championships, three straight MVPs, and became the world's greatest trash talker. I mean, this dude literally owned folks psychologically with some of the brutal things he said. Magic Johnson started making some of the greatest looking passes in NBA history and introduced an entirely new way of running an offense simply by doing things with the basketball that no one had ever seen before. But get this, neither Bird nor Magic were ever seen as villains in the NBA. They had an extreme rivalry and fans sided with either one or the other, but they were both seen as heroes and never anything close to being bad guys. Well, just a few years later, there was this one franchise that began taking its toll on NBA fans in a way that might have even been beyond Magic and Bird. They didn't necessarily do it by doing something that no other team had done before. They didn't even have that one leader or superstar that was widely accepted by NBA fans. They didn't even bend or break the rules. Well, unless you say that they got away with nearly killing guys on the floor. But you know where I'm going with this. The, and speaking of bad, the bad boy Detroit Pistons of the mid to late 80s and the early 90s. Look, forget the NBA. I don't think there was ever another franchise in any sport that was more polarizing at any given time than the Detroit Pistons of Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dummers in the 80s and 90s. Like, were they loved? Hated? A bit of both? This team made fans emotional, to say the very least. Their physicality alone gave the NBA an entirely changed reputation because it was what helped them reach the highest stage of the sport, oftentimes doing it at the expense of the biggest star in the NBA, Michael Jordan. MJ became the most beloved athlete of all time. Everybody wore his shoes, were blown away by dunks that the game had never seen before. And well, Larry Bird called him God in sneakers at one point. So there's that, and nothing gave more fuel to the Detroit's villain reputation among fans across the world than Michael Jordan. Fans saw their favorite player being swung and tossed around by five guys wearing blue jerseys all game long whenever the two teams would play. Detroit even established a team motto that was basically to not let MJ go airborne. If he takes flight, we're screwed. If we bust his ass before he gets up in the air, then we won. It was literally that simple. Well, easier said than done, of course. But the Pistons did their job defensively better than any other team could do against the man who's still seen as by far the greatest offensive player in the history of basketball. Actually, MJ intimidated the Pistons so much that after dropping 59 points on the bad boys before the 1988 postseason, Detroit coach Chuck Daly came up with a master plan to stop and literally break MJ. They called it the Jordan Rules, aka slap him silly if he comes across the lane and don't let him dribble, dribble, dribble. In return, it's what made the Detroit Pistons the most scrutinized and most hated championship winning team of all time. Never had the game seen such physicality work to such an extent 
that it would be the driving force to multiple NBA titles. And even till today, over three decades later, they're seen as a one-of-a-kind group that we won't ever get to see again. At least, not with how today's rules are. I mean, unless Detroit put a guy on life support, only then would they get a flagrant one called. Breathe on a player today, and you'll get thrown out of the game. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I noticed as I sat down to research this video? NBA villains have really, really changed over the years. In the 1980s and 90s, guys earned that notorious label as a villain, not because of who they were off the court or what they said in the post-game media session. Guys became villains because of their relentless and ferocious style of play on the court. It's why fans of the game think the players are quote-unquote soft today, because they don't really show that tough, enforcer persona on the court as guys did 20 or 30 years ago. Throughout the 1990s, some guys weren't all that loved by NBA fans, but I don't know if that necessarily makes them a villain or at the very top of the proverbial most wanted list for NBA fans. Charles Oakley, Dennis Rodman, John Stockton, Bruce Bowen, all guys that were seen as tough physical players and even dirty in some cases, but they weren't exactly a magnet for hate and backlash like the bad boys or like some teams and players were in generations after them. The Bulls in the 1990s were the world's most successful franchise. And anytime you win a lot and have players that are constantly in the public's eye, there is some natural resentment among players and fans for that team. But the Bulls were that one outlier because they had Michael Jordan. Again, simply the most revolutionary athlete of all time. You simply could not hate Michael Jordan, especially in a time where social media wasn't a thing and it wasn't commonplace for an athlete to publicly acknowledge things like politics. MJ's play was one thing, but his persona and charisma off the court made him impossible to hate or turn him into a villain. In the late 90s and early 2000s, we had another genre of the NBA's most successful franchise and the most dominating team in basketball, the LA Lakers of Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. Villains? Eh, debatable, I guess. Beloved? Not exactly. This was a team led by Shaq, who was simply the most dominating force many NBA fans had ever seen. And the way things ended in Orlando for Shaq, coupled with his overwhelming size, made him equally loved and hated among NBA fans. He was huge, so fans didn't think it was fair that the Lakers had someone like him and no other team did. Shaq was impossible to referee, which again, attracts more hate. And then Shaq's teammate was Kobe. The same Kobe who didn't even try to deny the fact that he was literally copying Michael Jordan's every mannerism and every move on and off the court. Not everyone loved that Kobe was trying to become the next iteration of Michael Jordan. There was only one Mike. And Kobe shouldn't have tried to become it, according to NBA fans. But he did. And then Kobe and Shaq won three straight titles while they were famously beefing and bickering which made the scope on Kobe and Shaq even greater. But that's normal, right? Every franchise that dominates at a particular time draws resentment from fans. Well, unless you're the Spurs. They don't even belong in this video because the Spurs will forever be the only sports franchise ever that won a lot and was never hated. Like, at all. They were so boringly great that people ignored them. <laughs> but circling back to Kobe, he at one point was actually seen as, dare I say, a villain. The huge talking point among NBA fans was that Kobe ran Shaq out of town, which is what gave Shaq his sympathetic, fun symbol and persona that he still carries to this day. And then when Shaq began moving from team to team while clearly looking way out of shape and way past his prime, he was more of a meme in the eyes of the public than a polarizing star, which is still one of the craziest things to think about to this day. It's crazy how Shaq went from this overpowering monster to some playful, joking persona that everyone loves to laugh at. But Kobe, meanwhile, was catching a lot of flack for the Lakers' struggles. Maybe if you didn't run Shaq out of town, y'all would have still been a dynasty, said many Lakers fans and most NBA fans. And then we know what happened with a couple of Kobe's off-the-court scandals. The time he stopped shooting in a playoff series against the Suns, Kobe's abrupt trade demand, and other things that made the Mamba one of the most scrutinized players in the NBA at one point. And I think Kobe's temporary rise to playing the villain role in the NBA was the transition to NBA villains of the modern day. Who held the keys after Kobe? The Boston Celtics of Paul Pierce, KG, and Ray Allen had potential, but they played for Boston, and they constantly kicked LeBron out of the playoffs. Plus, people wanted to see the Celtics and Lakers play in the NBA each year, so Kobe's role as the villain slowly faded away, and the Celtics never got close to the criticism any of the NBA's modern big threes got. Fast forward a couple of years later, and I think we got what will always go down as the NBA's greatest villains. 
LeBron James, and the 2010 Miami Heat. Boston's big three was one thing, but this was the first time ever a player got up and walked out the door of his former team to go play with another top five player in the NBA. And fans couldn't stand LeBron for that. They burned his jersey, gave him death threats, prayed for his downfall more than any other athlete ever, and the Miami Heat were the NBA's version of America's Most Wanted. Every opposing arena booed LeBron, and he had zero supporters outside of the folks in South Beach. Like, I wonder how LeBron went about his life knowing that he has the better part of the entire country after him. And then how about the time LeBron first returned to Cleveland, aka the scariest game in NBA history? The NBA had some extra precautionary measures they took before this game was tipped off. Check out this statement from a Cavs spokesperson before the game. We're not trying to create a police state for this game, he said. We've gone through a very comprehensive process with the league security folks, the local authorities, the Cleveland Police Department, and feel like we have a great plan in place to make sure we have a safe, law-abiding environment. Yeah, it actually went that far. A comprehensive process with local authorities and the Cleveland Police Department. When do you ever hear something like that? What was this, a war zone? But that's not all. This is what a member of security at the arena said about LeBron's return to Cleveland. We brought four team security members, and then we used Cleveland police officers. What wasn't made up were the 9-volt batteries being thrown on the court. I remember a member of the NBA's security team wanted to call the game because there was so much coming at us during this game, and we were basically ducking behind the scorer's table just to not get hit. Security personnel are there at an NBA game to ensure everything remains in an orderly fashion. And these guys during the Cleveland-Miami game were hoping to get out of the arena alive. He even went as far as saying that the entire game was nearly shut down early over extreme concerns of violence and other egregious acts that could put everyone in the arena in real danger. That's what had become of LeBron James. The kid from Akron wielded the feel-good story of being drafted first overall at 18 years old by his hometown squad. But the game's next Michael Jordan became the most hated man in the world, which ultimately shut down any chances that LeBron would ever be regarded as a better player than Mike. At least, that's what it seemed like at the time. Remember how I was saying that the Pistons of the 80s and 90s made people feel all types of ways? Well, the Miami Heat downright infuriated people, and no team was ever as hated as the Miami Heat of LeBron James. When they lost to Dallas in the 2011 Finals, there were far more fans celebrating Miami's loss than Dallas's win. But kind of like the pattern we've seen of villains in the NBA, they're really short-lived. Everyone hated LeBron then, but look at him now. He's the face of the NBA to this day, and routinely wins the popular vote among fans for the NBA All-Star Game. So being an NBA villain sounds harsh and kind of scary, but it really isn't that bad. This brings us to that kind of, sort of quiet period in the NBA, where there really wasn't one team or one player that was hated by everyone, but only for like a year or two. After a couple of years passed for LeBron in Miami, fans accepted the fact that this was just the new reality, and that we need someone else to hate now. LeBron would eventually leave Miami in 2014 to go back to Cleveland, so a lot of that villain role for LeBron became largely diminished. In fact, his coming home speech mended the fence with Cleveland and even the team owner Dan Gilbert after he called LeBron a quitter a few years earlier. Think back to 2015. Was there some team or player that was the consensus villain in the NBA? It wasn't LeBron anymore. We're getting ready to see the third iteration of the NBA's bad boys, the Golden State Warriors. This is crazy. Steph Curry was on a Michael Jordan trajectory in terms of stature and winning the hearts of NBA fans. He won MVP out of nowhere in 2015, putting together one of the most exciting MVP seasons in the history of the NBA. And then, a year later, he temporarily stole the face of the NBA mantle from LeBron by wowing us with things we hadn't ever seen before. And I think Steph Curry would have done only something Michael Jordan was able to do, and that is be beloved by 99% of NBA fans while still leading the most dominant sports franchise in the world. If, maybe just if, Kevin Durant didn't come knocking on his door just a year later. And this right here became something. Something that I think molded the NBA into the NBA we are watching today. The Warriors with Kevin Durant outdid even the Miami Heat of LeBron James from a scrutiny and hate standpoint. We look back at the Heat as just a parody of what was to come with the Golden State Warriors. Just look at it this way. The Warriors slowly began entering the villain phase when they started nearing the Chicago Bulls' previous win record of 72 wins in the season. Because more and more people began comparing a Michael Jordan team to the Warriors, fans began resenting the Warriors in a way they didn't with any other team ever. 
Steph Curry was drawing comparisons to Michael Jordan. People asked if the 2016 Warriors were better than the 1996 Bulls. And then to add all the fire, what many saw as the second best player in the NBA got up from a pretty good situation in Oklahoma City, where he was just one game away from a trip to the NBA Finals three, three different times, and turned right around and joined the team he had down 3-1. The thing is, what LeBron did made people really, really mad. But what LeBron did was that he joined a team that won 40-something games the year before and was an early playoff exit. KD went to a team that appeared in the last two NBA Finals and won the ship just two seasons earlier when he joined them. So, in a way, this made LeBron's move to Miami look somewhat more digestible for NBA fans. And more so, now that KD became public enemy number one on the most hated team in all of sports. Oh, and I didn't even mention KD's teammate that he now had alongside him. I'm not talking about Steph or Clay. I'm talking about Draymond Green, who, in a lot of ways, felt like a modern-day Dennis Rodman with his physical play and his building reputation as a dirty player. This meant that not only were the Warriors hated because they stacked so much talent and made it unfair for 98% of the league to contend, they had KD, who went from hero and sympathetic figure to villain and basketball criminal overnight. And they also had Draymond Green, who was notorious for being a loudmouth and a guy that likes kicking people in the balls. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't leave that part out. Sorry. People hated the Miami Heat only because LeBron went there. And then they went from being a team no one talked about to a team that everyone wants to fail. The Warriors were becoming the villain before KD even arrived, and then officially started to rival the bad boys from a hate standpoint when they got KD. LeBron was slandered by a lot of people for a good long summer. But KD, he had not just fans, but players, actual players in the NBA that called him out. Stephen A. Smith even went on ESPN the next hour and famously called it the weakest move he's ever seen from a superstar player. KD even deleted his Instagram account shortly after signing with the Warriors because he was getting utterly destroyed by the entire world for doing what he did in free agency. This might have been the only time a player became so villainized that everyone started referring to him as a snake. LeBron got called Scottie Pippen or Robin as an insult when he joined D-Wade, but calling a dude a snake? That's literally all I ever heard KD being referred to as for a solid two or three years. But similar to LeBron in Miami, the more KD won, the quieter the criticism got. KD did, of course, reel off back-to-back -back MVPs in the finals, all while talking smack to some 14-year-olds on Twitter every chance he got, and also was apparently rocking burner accounts to fire back at any and everyone who tried bashing him. You do you, KD, I guess. I get a strong feeling that if social media was where it was in 2016, back in 2010, LeBron would have caught even more heat than KD. I mean, just think about it for a second. LeBron was being shredded to pieces when social media wasn't a big thing. But regardless, KD probably owned the most interesting villain phase in the history of the NBA from an individual standpoint. I think it was even worse than LeBron's phase. And it's mostly because the Warriors created a monopoly over the NBA. And their best competition was LeBron's Cavs. And they wiped him out in five in the 2017 NBA Finals. Ever since the Warriors band split up, we thankfully haven't seen anything similar, with one team standing over the rest of the league. There was a time when I thought Kawhi Leonard might have wielded the NBA's next villain, with how he stumped the Lakers and went to the Clippers. But Kawhi gained plenty of cash by leading Toronto to their first championship in franchise history. LeBron has his mix of lovers and haters, but he's still the face of basketball and a member of the hallowed LA Lakers. KD, although not exactly loved, isn't hated anymore either. Steph's always been the baby-faced assassin that every kid in the world loves. Hmm, are there any more villains in the NBA? You know what? While he isn't exactly a villain the way someone like KD or LeBron was, he had his moment for a while. And I'm talking about Ben Simmons. Hated for not being able to shoot. Hated for not passing up an open layup against the Atlanta Hawks in 2021. And hated for being a historically bad free throw shooter in that same series. Never did I think that I would see a player become the villain for any length of time by performing poorly in just one playoff series. His coach Doc Rivers said he doesn't know if he could win with Ben Simmons at point guard. His teammate Joel Embiid took several between the line shots. Ben held out and demanded a trade, and the rest was history. All last season, Simmons stayed quiet and no one knew what was wrong with, oh, and we saw him in some pretty impressive drip sitting on the bench. But we didn't know what was wrong with him. 
And then all the reports on Simmons' mental health condition, and the fact that people thought the Nets with Kyrie and KD could have potentially won a championship if he came back and played, let's just say Simmons was by far the most hated dude in the NBA for a solid year and a half. But now he's back and playing, and no one seems to care, you know? I've always thought that villains are great for the NBA. It's the storylines, the narrative, the one everyone's rooting against, the bad guy, the drama, the media reactions, and everything related. It's great theater for the NBA. And although there's still more to see before we can tell, the Memphis Grizzlies with Dylan Brooks and John Morant are on that villain trajectory. I don't know if they're there yet, where the vast majority of NBA fans despise them completely, but they're certainly on that pace, especially if they keep picking fights with players and teams people now love, like Golden State or Donovan Mitchell. I don't know. We might have to revisit this conversation another day. But one thing is for certain, the NBA's in a better place when there's someone to root against.